A blessed New Year to all of you, and to all of you at home as well, for those of you who, uh, we have extra seats here this morning, so that means uh, there was lots of choices to stay up late last night and to sleep in and worship from home this morning, so uh, a greeting to uh, everyone here and to those at home, I hope you're all comfortable at home as well. This This is the first time we can say that truly... Hindsight is 2020, and uh, see, you guys laughed way better than you did on Sunday. So, because my grandson still thinks it's a horrible joke, but uh, yeah, glad that you can all be here. We stand at the beginning of a new year. It's a time of hope, anticipation. Uh, last year at this time, uh, we were in uh, the other church and. All this was still new before us, and now we look behind, and uh, part of looking behind, and we'll do this a little later in the service, is about seeing where God has been. Um, And as the one psalm says, uh, we remember in order that we can believe more strongly. Uh, We look for where God has been and how he has led us. So I invite you to stand as we begin our worship. It's a litany based on Psalm 100. So shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And part of God's faithfulness is his presence. And we know that God is with us as we stand here at the beginning of a new year. And he greets us with these words from scripture. May grace, may mercy, and may peace be yours today and always from God the Father and Jesus the Christ through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen. And as God has greeted us, I invite you to turn and greet each other, wish each other a blessed new year, and to those at home as well. (laughs) And we remember our God is faithful, so we sing, Great is thy faithfulness.
Yeah, you may be seated. The beginning of a year, it's always good to remember that our identity is in Christ, um, that we find our hope, we find our comfort, our peace, uh, not in the things that we have, not in the events around us, but it all comes back to God. So we begin our year by confessing our faith uh, with the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. So what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. When I was visiting a church in Uganda, the pastor, when he found out I was from the Christian Reformed Church, he came up and he said, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the gift of the Heidelberg Catechism. I want to thank you for the gift of question and answer one. In a small church, in a small village, they regularly confessed what we just confessed. But that's where our comfort and that's where our hope lies. It lies in Jesus Christ. And that's, what, that's why we can look back at 2020 and we can say, yeah, it wasn't the year we wanted. It wasn't the year that we had expected. You have to say it was an interesting year. Um, but it's easy to say, yeah, this is what was bad about it. This is what's horrible. And this is all I've heard, honestly, for the last couple of weeks from people. I can't wait until 2020 is over and we're in 2021. It was such a horrible year. I'd like to take a different approach this morning, just for a moment. And I'd like to ask you, where did you see God working in 2020? What are some of your good memories from 2020? And I know it may make you think just a little bit. So I'm, I'll begin by, by sharing. What I appreciate about 2020 is how it stretched me. As a pastor, as a person, I was able to see that I had strengths I didn't realize or I had forgotten I had had and I wasn't tapping into anymore. Uh, the ability to think on my feet and adjust on the fly, but I also was made aware of certain weaknesses that I struggle with. Um, yeah, things like, uh, like anger, um, the whole mask and no mask. Um, I got in some pretty heated discussions and afterwards walked away and said, I should not have gotten so, so uh, emotionally involved in those. So it was a really, in a lot of ways, a personal growth year for me in learning, being reminded, but also saying, yeah, there are still a number of things I really still need to work on uh, in terms of becoming more and more who I believe God wants me to be. But I also saw, I saw Bethel Church come together in some beautiful ways. This whole building uh, thing going on, this renovation. I see people stepping up and all kinds of work and creativity and, and, and beauty and, and, and just so much coming together. But I saw Vacation Bible School. Again, so many people doing Vacation Bible School online or canceling it all together. And, uh, and I saw a number of you step up and say, we can do something different. We can do something uh, for the community that will give them a really special day. And uh, so, again, some really cool things that happened in this past year. Uh, some were good for me, even though I didn't appreciate them uh, at the time. You know, some growth moments, but also uh, just seeing Bethel as a church stepping up in so many cool ways. So what are some of your good memories from 2020? 
And for you at home, you know, I would encourage you to either write it on, uh, uh, on the YouTube channel or perhaps send an a email or a text and we can share some of your responses in, uh, in an upcoming service as well. But for those of you who are here present in person, what are some good things you're going to look back on 2020 from? Oh, cool. Yeah, you kind of save a bit of a drive, but you live in a pretty cool building there, too. It's, uh, you're going to have whole church services just with you guys there. It's, uh, a, lot a lot more family time. I have heard that from many uh, young families, especially. Thank you so much. And, and I heard you start to... Return for congregation in May. Oh, okay. That was in May at Gilbert's place. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Those... I'm thankful that we were able to continue with Circle of Prayer. Yeah. Because we serve meals every week. Yeah, we did not miss a week with Circle of Friends. That... that t- Turnaround was so fast. Uh, kudos to all those and all of you involved. Um, others. Yeah, the, the Lord led you in, in changing your timing. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for, for sharing. I know you probably were not expecting to be asked to think of good things from 2020. Um, but as I, as I hear and as I listen, and I look forward to emails or texts or, or whatever from those of you at home listening in, uh, and participating as well. Um, again, the Lord does not make a year so horrible that he doesn't also reveal himself in many ways as well. So let's offer a prayer uh, for, for the new year. God, thank you for helping us to make it through this past difficult year. Thank you that you've carried us through the uncertainty of deep waters, through the flames of trials, and through the pain of hard losses. We're constantly aware of how much we need you, your strength, your grace, your power working 
through us even on the toughest of days. So we ask you to help us to keep our focus first on you in the year before us. Please forgive us for giving too much time and attention to other things, for looking to other people before coming to you first. Thank you that you came to give new life, peace, hope, and joy. And thank you that your power is made perfect in our weakness. Help us to remember that the gift of Christ, Emmanuel, is our greatest treasure, and not just at Christmas, but for the whole year through. So we ask you to fill us with your joy and the peace of your spirit. Direct our hearts and minds towards you. Thank you for your reminder that both in seasons of celebration and in seasons of brokenness, you're still with us. For you never leave us. Thank you for your daily powerful presence in our lives, that we can be assured your heart is towards us, your eyes are over us, and your ears are open to our prayers. Thank you that you surround us with favors, with a shield, and that we are safe in your care. We choose to press in close to you today and to keep you first in our heart and lives. Without you, we would surely fail, but with you there is great hope. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you for bringing us into this new year, 2021. And we look forward to all that you still have in store for us. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. We're going to look at a passage this morning. It's uh, from Joshua chapter 4. It's always a challenge trying to pick a passage for New Year's Day where you're kind of saying, okay, this is about looking a little bit behind, but mostly looking ahead. And I chose Joshua 4 because Israel has been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, and now they're crossing and have crossed the Jordan River. This is a whole new chapter in their lives. And, uh, and as I thought, as we move into our new renovated building, the potential that lies within it uh, and lies within us as God's people uh, to utilize it well, we're entering a new chapter as well of our uh, lives as a church. So I invite you to turn on your tablets, on your phone, um, in your Bibles, on screen to Joshua 4. So Joshua writes, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the, the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp, where they put them down. Joshua set up the twelve stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over. And as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over, ready for battle, in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed them. 
About 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. That day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they had stood in awe of Moses. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And no sooner had they set their foot on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God, the word of the Lord. Lord, we stand here worshiping you, beginning the year worshiping you. And Lord, we stand here filled with hope and with anticipation, uh, with a, a sense of excitement of uh, of what you have in store for us. And Lord, we come and we begin with worship so that, you know, in our worship that, that you may shape us and form us more and more into who you're calling us to be. And Lord, I pray that the words which will be spoken now, Lord, may they be your words and not mine. Pray this in the name of Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So yeah, it's 2021, a new year. Start of a new year. Man. And we tend to look ahead rather than to look back, especially when you have a year like 2020. A lot of changes happened in our lives. Uh, you know, some of them are, are sad. Uh, some of them are, are neutral. Um, see, it depends what you call sad and neutral. For me, you know, turning another year older is kind of neutral. Lots of people, especially when they kind of hit a zero year, they kind of go, oh, man, that's sad. Well, except when you're, say, 19 and turning 20. But, uh, yeah, there's all these different ways we approach change. And then there's been some really, really happy changes as well. You know, I, I got to do my nephew's uh, wedding, so we invited somebody into the family. We had a birth in the church, and, you know, all these really cool things happen as well. So, yeah. It's a mixed bag, 2020, a little bit mixed towards one end and the other, and we hope that 2021 is kind of mixed towards the good side rather than the rougher side. But 2020 revealed a lot about our society and about us as well. And it was a, it was a year that, that really challenged us in a lot of ways in terms of where we put our trust and where we get our identity from. And, and it was surprising to me because you look back, and I think as you look back, 2020 will be defined by a, a virus, an election, and for Bethel, our building renovation. And that virus and that election created a whole lot of division created a whole lot of hurt. And that's, for me, the saddest part. Created even accusations. Social media became a rather nasty place where people stated out their positions. And there was no, there was no discussions. There was just a lot of hard words. And that just created more division. 
2020 has been a year of fear. There were those who feared the virus. But then there were those who feared the loss of freedom. I remember being accused of, you know, being filled with fear that as a pastor I should be able to move forward with confidence. And I said, I do move forward with confidence. But I choose certain ways of walking forward. But as I reflected over the, over the last few months, I realized we all lived in fear. We just feared different things. And that's why when God comes visit us, and we looked at the angels visiting, you know, Zechariah and Mary, and, and as you read to the story of Jesus' birth, the first thing the angels always say is, don't be afraid. It seems to be a natural part of who we are. Sometimes we just don't want to acknowledge it. But fear easily turns to anger. And we saw so much anger this year. I was surprised by how much the American election affected us. I was amazed by how Canadians, you know, were so strongly for or against the different presidential candidates. And I was amazed at how Christians could speak so unkindly and could take such hard positions on one side or the other. Again, creating more division. Because it became about identity. We began identifying ourselves by sides. And I thought, somewhere along the line, we lost our identity in Christ. And that's why I was thankful for the building renovation. Because that's created excitement. That's created hope. And, and as I talked with people, and many of you about, you know, moving back in, you know, we began to talk about, you know, the potential of reaching our community for Jesus. We, we began to say, you know what, this could be one of these stepping stones into creating a much more relationships with people in, in Lacombe and, and in the other area and, and working with other churches to, to help bring the gospel, help bring Jesus, invite people into a relationship with Jesus. And so that building renovation for me was a godsend because it got, gave me opportunities to speak hope to speak something else other than anger and fear into people's lives. And that's so important because we are people of hope. We're, we're a people of the promise. We are a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are a people who have good news. And that's where our identity needs to lie. That's what my hope lies for 2021. And it's been a year of change. For some of us, some of the biggest changes have been in our relationship with Jesus. I have watched some of you grow deeper and deeper in your walk with God and with Jesus, and that has been so cool. I'm starting to get to know the youth. It's been kind of haphazard because of uh, COVID and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But, but we had seven or eight weeks where getting together on Tuesday night youth, starting to get to know some of the high school youth and, and, and having some really cool conversations about God. And I thought, yeah, the, the future of Bethel is in good hands. They had some really hard questions. And they, they face a, a world that's very different than the one I grew up in. But they, they ask hard questions. They ask good questions. And the fact that they ask questions means that they feel safe to do so. And for me, that was a beautiful sign. Because growing up, I didn't feel safe asking hard questions from the church. I was told just to be quiet and believe so I'm glad that younger people, that, that our youth, feel free enough to really push us hard on what we believe and why we believe it. Because then it helps us to grow deeper because we have to then think about what we believe and why we believe it. We can't just say, I believe in Jesus. Because then we have to say why we believe in Jesus. We have to talk about the hope that Jesus gives us. We have to be able to talk about why Jesus can make a difference in our community, why Jesus can make a difference in our world. 
So it forces us to go deeper with Jesus too. So those are some of the, the cool things in terms of our identity in Jesus that I saw happening. But I also walked with some of you who, who had some hard questions about Jesus and you, you felt that he was really far away. And it created doubts and hurt inside of you. But even in those moments, just the fact that you were asking hard questions, that gave me hope as well. Because when you're still asking the hard questions, you're not drifting away. You're fighting to stay close to Jesus. And again, you still want your identity to be in Christ. And that, for me, gives me lots of hope for the year ahead. The year ahead will bring changes. Some of them expected. We're going to get into a new building. And I'm excited about that. But there's going to be unexpected changes. And that's okay too. Because change is all right. Just think about yourselves. Think back 5, 10, 15 years ago. If you're not 15 yet, you only think back until what you can remember, and that's okay. But are you the same as you were um, 5 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago? I see heads shaking no. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Eh. <laughs> I know, when I was your age and I'm looking 10 years older, mom and dad were doing everything for me. That was a great thing. Um, now I got to do way too much. But I look at my relationship with Joyce or my relationship with my kids. If my relationship with Joyce is the same as it was 5, 10, 15 years ago, that is really sad news because that means we haven't grown in our relationship at all. I look back and my relationship with Bethel when I first, I came on April Fool's Day and now I'm thinking, man, that really the joke was on you because when I came, you know, COVID happens and everything else and you kind of go, whoa, you pulled a joke on me because you didn't tell me about a building renovation that was in the plans. Um, and I'm going, hmm, so maybe April 1st was a good day to come here and be, start uh, my role as your pastor. But, but again, as I've gotten to know you, You've played a, a role in shaping me more and more. Um, I'm hoping into a better pastor. There are a number of you who challenge me on my views or on my opinions or, or on things that I preach or teach. And you've forced me to think more deeply about who God is and my own relationship with God. And that makes me change. And I say thank you for that. Because that's really important. Because change shows health. Change shows growth. A healthy relationship with Jesus, that also needs to keep changing as well. Hopefully, growing more and more deeply in trust and in faith as we walk closely with him and each other. And maybe... This will be a year of change where Jesus will say, I'm calling you to step out of your comfort zone. I would encourage youth, young adults, think about what God might have in store for you. Are some of you being called maybe into the mission field or into nonprofit work or into ministry or, or maybe taking over your dad's farm or your grandfather's farm or maybe you have been told, you know, you need to do this because you're going to make a lot of money and have a solid future in this career, but maybe God's leading you into a career that's a little different. Always stay open to the moving of the Holy Spirit. I remember one young lady in Montreal, she was going to McGill Law School, and uh, she had a brilliant mind. She has a brilliant mind. And she was going to go into international law. She was going to uh, 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 work in the uh, Den Haag, in the, in the World Court. And, and she had the ability to do so. She had an incredibly, incredibly uh, creative and, and strong intellect. 
But we had some, we had some stuff happen in the church and in our community. And they needed some wisdom from a, a lawyer. So she agreed to do some pro bono work. And it was in an abusive situation. And, and as she walked that journey with, with those people over a period of five or six months, we sat down and had a number of talks about what she was doing. And also looking ahead to her moving to, to the Netherlands and starting her position there because she had an offer already, even though she had almost a year left in her study. And then one day she said, Pastor Jake, I don't know if I'm going to the Netherlands. You know, I'll, I'll be able to do great things in the Netherlands. I'll be able to, to make worldwide decisions and, and fight, you know, situations that, that, that impact, you know, countries. She said, I found more meaning walking alongside this family, walking alongside these kids, offering them hope. She's working in downtown Toronto in a small law firm where about half their work is pro bono for free, just helping broken families, helping abused families, to just kind of make it through from one day to another, offering hope. She said, if you wouldn't have asked, if I wouldn't have followed God's leading in this, I would never have known that this is what she, he wanted from me. So as you look at your relationship with the Lord this year, whether you're younger or older, be open to, to the Holy Spirit's leading. Joshua and the Israelites, they've been wandering for 40 years. You kind of get used to wandering. You get kind of itchy feet. And yeah, the promised land is just there and everything else, but, but your identity kind of gets set after 40 years. Now God's calling them to do something new, calling them to cross the river. And, and in crossing that river, that water is rushing, it's flood stage, and how are they going to do that? And then God says, okay, send the ark and the priests in the middle first. And as soon as they stick their foot in, the water stops. And, and they stand right there, but, but the problem is, you know, as we look back at a year, as we move forward, as we kind of live our daily lives, we sometimes get memory loss especially when things, you know, we accomplish stuff. And, and, and God knew that, and Joshua knows that, and that's why jo God tells Joshua, hey, you know what, pick up some rocks, right from the middle of the river, right from the place where they would never be able to get them from before. And I want you to build a monument on the other side. And I want you to build that monument so that you don't forget. You don't forget me. You don't forget who's really doing all this. Because they, they've been fighting for 40 years. They're a powerful army now. 40,000 men were, were crossing to go to battle. And, and these are battle-hardened people. There's, there's the, 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 the people of the land were afraid of them. Just read the story of Rahab. But they had that river. And that puts them in a weak place. A weak position. But God says, you know what? I'm taking care of you. I'm with you. As you cross over into your new future, there is going to be change. You're going to change from being a wandering people to being a, a people all of a sudden that are going to become farmers and merchants. You're going to build houses and barns, and at some point, you'll build a temple. And, but, but you're going to change. Your identity is going to change. And as your identity changes, don't forget who's with you. Don't forget who's actually responsible. Don't get so caught up in your own strength and your own achievements that you forget that I'm really the one who's all behind it. See, we easily give ourselves way more credit and for we forget God's role. And that's why God says this monument's really important. And as we watch Israel entering the promised land, we see, you know, they haven't really accomplished anything yet. 
They're moving forward in trust without knowing exactly what lies ahead. Yet there's some powerful city kingdoms there, Jericho. They can see right from, from the Jordan River. They know that there's all kinds of tribes and kings and that all in that land, and they're going to have to fight them all, and, and they're going to have to defeat them all. And, but exactly what is that going to look like, and how long is it going to take, and, and how many of them are going to die, and... and And who are we going to really become? That's why the Israelites are so afraid to enter 40 years before that. But the people say, you know what? We're ready now. We've seen God working for 40 years. And Joshua trusts God to lead the people forward. And the people trust Joshua. I think that's one of the blessings of this past year and a half that I've been with you as well, well more than a year and a half, but there's a strong leadership that your council, you know, both the council that came here and the council that now, you have chosen some good councils. People who are focused on, on the Lord, focused on leading well, focused on unity, focused on and saying, we want to be who God's calling us to be, but they do it well. And that comes from somebody who has not always served on councils that have worked well. But you are blessed with good leadership. And you can trust in them, as the Israelites trusted in Joshua. So when you look at where we're at as a church or as individuals, we face obstacles as well in the year ahead. You know, and one of the obstacles I was thinking about was contentment. You know, we're going to get into the new church and it's going to be beautiful and pretty and, and I'm really looking forward to the study. You guys are doing amazing, amazing work in there as well. But, but I noticed last night that when you drive by, and everything is dark, and you look in the church, because of all the, the, the renovations, all you see is a backlit cross. And it reminded me that when the community drives by, they're going to see that backlit cross. It was also a reminder for me that we gotta take that light from that cross and it's our role to shine it brightly into the neighborhood, into the community right around Bethel and into the broader community where each of our, us are at as well. So contentment, you know, we can, we can kind of get settled in there and say, oh, we've worked so hard the last year to get in here. But that's just the first step. There is so much more waiting for us. Another obstacle is rebuilding community. As I pray through the, through the church directory, it saddens me in a lot of ways that there are some faces I have not seen for six, seven, eight months because of all the restrictions and, on worship and being unable to gather in the different ministries uh, that all the people are involved in. And it saddens me, but it also makes me realize you know, we, we slowly drift uh, apart when you don't actually see each other regularly either. That's why in Hebrews it says, don't give up meeting together. And, and how, even though I got all kinds of plans and hopes for Bethel Church, we're going to have to slow down for a bit, especially the first part of the year, and, and just rebuild community, reconnect with each other again. You know, going to have to work maybe with the worship committee and say, Maybe we got to set in place a, a prayer kind of initiative for the church where, where maybe we, we, we sign up to pray for, for different people in the church. And 
I don't know. We, we're going to have to do some, some dreaming there. But, but my hope is that some of the, the ministries can start up again, the, the youth ministry, the men's breakfast. And we're looking forward and dreaming towards some conferences and that as well. We're even working together to pull off the conferences. You know, it builds unity. It builds a sense of purpose. A, it builds a sense of oneness once again. And, and that's, what, that's an, another obstacle that kind of lies in our way. And... And as I talk with people in, in, in our community and uh, people all around, Bethel is a really friendly church. But the challenge is to take that next step and to become a hospitable church. To invite people into our, our lives, our hearts, our souls so that they feel free to invite us into theirs as well. I write a pastor's report every three months. And you know what the hardest part of writing that report is? Is that last section where I say where I'm at, my family and I. And there are times I have to admit that I'm not always in the best of places. But that's because I want to be open and honest with the leadership. Because if I'm open and honest with them, hopefully they're open and honest with me. And then we become more than friends. We, we become much closer. We become family. Our relationship changes. And that's where, that's the next step we need to take as well. That we become more vulnerable. That we invite people into our lives. Into the deeper part of our lives. And it's hard. It's an obstacle. But the Holy Spirit's guiding us giving us lots of opportunities to get more deeply connected into our community here in Lacombe, but I think also more deeply connected with each other. And at some point, we need to pick up our robes and step out into that river and, and make the crossing into the new future, re- remembering that and trusting that Jesus is with us, even while he leads us. And just like Israel, we're going to need perseverance, we're going to need strength, we're going to need courage and faith. And, and as we, we, we move forward into this new year, we say, God, use us. Use even us. Bless us so that we might be a blessing. You know, help us to be a, a strong community with each other in order to, to invite the community to become part of God's community. And Israel was told to take one rock. We got little rocks here. Israel was told to pick up a a rock, one from each tribe, and to build a monument. I was talking to a Jewish friend about this story years ago, and he said, this is a story of moving from me to we. We. Because the tribes were still tribes. They still had their, their bickering and their feuding among each other. But by building that monument together, it's one monument where it's me, 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 and we become a we. And I thought, wow, that is a powerful part of the story I had never, never realized before. And that's, that's one of my dreams for, for us as a church as well. That we put some of that divisiveness, some of that conflict, some of that other identity stuff from last year and, and into the new year, we move forward with a, an identity that's completely focused on Jesus together. God tells the Israelites to build that monument to remember what happened to remember that just as God worked 40 years before that in the, with the Red Sea, bringing them from a, a slaves into freedom, so that now God is going to do something similar, cross on dry ground again, but they're going to go from a nomadic people who are warriors, and they're going to become farmers and merchants. But they are going to be God's people in the world, given a home, given a place. And that's a pretty cool thing. But it's God doing it. It's not them. 
And the Holy Spirit is preparing the way for us as well. Just like the ark went ahead of the Israelites into the Jordan River, and the Holy Spirit is ahead of us already working in Lacombe working in the lives of, of friends, of neighbors, of, of co-workers, of fellow students. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. You can be in grade one or kindergarten and tell your friend who Jesus is. And that might make a difference in their family. You can be 90 years old in, in, in one of the, the homes and you can talk to your neighbor who lives just down the hallway about who Jesus is make a difference in their life as well. It doesn't matter how old, but we remember that it's Jesus. And we look at these rocks and remember that, that, that these are built out of stones, common stones from the middle of the river, and they're made as a monument. Plain, simple things, but they are so strong. And we're reminded as, as well that God is a rock as well. He is strong. But then Jesus comes and he points us to common everyday things like, like, like wine and bread and water. And he says, and in these small things, everyday things, you see the strength of me, the strength of my spirit in you and among you. Those are, are our rocks. They're our monuments. And the, the, the people of Bethel Church is also a monument to the world of who God is and what God's doing. So how do you remember the important moments in your life? Pictures? Something that you bought or made? But we create something visual so that when we see it, we're reminded again. I wear this cross, not just because it reminds me of Jesus, but for me it's a small monument of a young girl in Montreal from Pakistan. They went back to Pakistan for a family wedding and in a market in Islamabad, she saw this. And they said it's from an olive tree that was from the land of Israel. And, uh, and I don't know how true that is, but, but for her, that meant it came from the place that Jesus comes from. And she told her grandpa, we got to buy that for Brother Pastor Jacob. So she bought it with her own money at a market in Islamabad, and she came back to Montreal and gave it to me. For me, it's a sign of her faith. It was also a sign of community. It reminds me that the body of Christ, um, they had moved from Pakistan, became part of the church in Montreal, became part of a, a Dutch Christian Reformed church. Um, reminds us that the body of Christ is worldwide. And that all our identity, even though we've come from different languages and cultures and, 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 and different ways of doing things, that, that our strength is in God as our rock. It's in Jesus Christ. So the beginning of the new year is a, a good time to remind ourselves of who we are. To say, yeah, we're Jesus people. Reminds us that God has done these things so that all the people on earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful so that renovation is not done by us. Well, it is, and eagle builders. But, but it's done for God. It's done to show the people of Lacombe and the area who God is and that God has done these things so that they can know who Jesus is as well. That's why we're placed here, to help people know that Jesus is strong enough to carry them through any storm of life, through any year of life, even 2020. And we're becoming who Jesus has created us to be. I see a humility in Bethel Church that is beautiful. They want to help others know Jesus through serving in so many different ways. And we serve with grace and generosity. It's 
It's about being followers of Jesus who are excited about following Jesus. My, my goal and, and, and hope for Bethel Church is that, you know, when we're worshiping, we are as excited about worshiping Jesus on a Sunday morning, on a New Year's Day, even though some of us stayed up way too late. We're as excited about following Jesus and becoming who he wants us to be as Oiler fans are about following Connor McDavid, as, as Flames fan, I know there's a few of you around here, who are about following Johnny Hockey. As a Leafs fan is about, you know, following the Leafs. They're all great. We don't have just one great player. See, hockey's about to start, so <laughs> I'm getting excited. But, but I, want, I want us to be as excited about following Jesus as we can be excited about people. If we can be excited about people, how much more can we get excited about who Jesus is? And that is one of my hopes and prayers for the year. And Jesus says, you know what, we don't do this alone moving forward into the new year. That he is with us always through the Holy Spirit. So we need courage, we need trust uh, as, we, as we make the changes that we'll be called to make. Um, we'll need something to remind us that this is something the Holy Spirit is guiding us into. Um, so I'm inviting you at the end of the service to come up and grab a rock. They're small rocks, they're smooth rocks. Stick them in your pocket. So that as you walk through the year, every time you stick your hand in your pocket, you're reminded that this is a year for Jesus. We're reminded that we're pointing people to who Jesus is. That we're reminded that Jesus is with us as we're touching this rock, as we're remembering. And, and for those of you who are at home, Once we get back into the new church, I am going to take a small little rock and I'm going to stick it in one in every mail slot. And I'm going to have a pile in my study as well so that if you want to to take some with you to hand to people as other people as well, that you'll have that opportunity as well. So that you'll have something with you every day of the year, wherever you are, to remind us of who we are to remind us that Jesus is walking with us through this 2021 and that he's going to accomplish great things in us and through us. I'm sure of that. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but I know it's going to happen because it is all about Jesus, about Jesus with us, in us, and through us. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guided us through 2020. And even as we remember this, there's some great moments in 2020. You were there. You were with us. You guided us. You've, you're accomplishing amazing things. And, and we're standing at the start of a new year. And, and Lord, there's so much potential that lies before us. And, and Lord, we're, we're entering into a new chapter of our life, just like Israel was in their life. And, and Lord, help us to remember that it's, it's what you're accomplishing, that it is all about you. And Lord, help us to have the excitement, the enthusiasm, the the trust that Israel showed as well because they knew that you were with them also. And and Lord, there would be obstacles, but Lord, give us strength and wisdom to to work through those obstacles. And, And Lord, we pray that as we stand, as we worship again next year on January 1st, that when we look back at 2021, we'll stand in awe of what you've been able to accomplish through us and in us and with us. So, Lord, we ask for your blessing, a blessing on us and on our church, not for ourselves, but that we might be a blessing, just as you called Abraham to be a blessing to all the nations. May we be a blessing to all those that you place in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do things a little bit different here. I had a prayer that I was supposed to read. uh, But what we'll do is we'll sing, lead me, guide me, and then we'll have this prayer, uh, and then we'll move into the parting blessing.
let's give a, a prayer, both reflecting back, but also looking forward to, uh, to the new year. So Lord, we give thanks for your faithfulness through this past year and for all our years. Ever since you created the world, you've been faithful in this past year. Is one more example of your goodness. We thank you for birth. We thank you for healing. We thank you for courage in the midst of tears. We thank you for comfort in the midst of despair. We thank you for strength in our weakness. We thank you for your faithfulness. But Lord, we also confess our faithlessness. We thought we had better things to do than spend time with you. We had other sources of hope apart from you. We went looking for satisfaction and meaning from other gods. Yes, other gods apart from you. And we paid the consequences for it. We lost meaning. We lost hope. We lost when you left your path to go our own way. And we confess our sins, and that brings us back to thanksgiving. We are thankful because your forgiveness is constant and your love is unfailing. We confess and are grateful to find you welcoming us back. You protect us from the wickedness of this world. There is so much hurt, so much evil, so much injustice. We see how people fail to care for your world and we grieve. We see how people treat one another and it horrifies us. We see evil people getting away with it and sometimes we give up hope. And then we see you move and act and restore and judge. And when we see you at work in your world, we cheer, we praise, and we recommit ourselves to you. We want what you want, Lord. We want a world that worships you. We want an earth that is healthy. We want marriages to be life-giving. We want children to grow in wonder and awe and love for you. We want every part of this world to be cleansed by the blood of your Son, on the cross. And we want our actions and our words and our thoughts to be holy. We want our lives to be controlled by you. Every moment, every movement, every decision, everything yours. And we want these things so that our everyday lives bring praise to you. When people look at us, we want them to know without any doubt that we belong to you and the whole world belongs to you. We thank you for this past year and we especially trust you for the new year. Amen. I invite you to stand for the blessing for this new year. So go, and may there always be work for your hands to do. May your purse always hold a coin or two. May the sun always shine upon your window pane. May a rainbow be certain to follow each rain. May the hand of a friend always be near to you, and may God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And we end with God the Father of your people. Lord be with you and bless you. And remember to pick up this stone. <laughs>